How's it going folks and welcome back to Newcastle, kind of. We're here, we're in the future, we've gone forward one season to kick things off and I thought a nice place to start would actually just be on my manager profile, something which I don't really recall ever showing during the save game. You will note the date in the top right is the 9th of June 2027. That does mean, of course, we've gone forward one year already. Uh, the plan of today's video is to do kind of a one season look in the future, look at the immediate aftermath of uh, well, our time at Newcastle. And then beyond that, we're going to go forward five years. Now, of course, I don't have a contract or a job at the moment, but what I do have is a lot of history and uh, well, quite a lot of money spent. £2.29 billion was the amount of money we ended up spending during our time at the club. £919 million made in players sold. So yeah, quite a hefty net investment of over a billion pounds over five years. Of course, that final transfer window where Erlen Haaland and co were signed for a rather silly amount of money definitely contributes to that. In terms of the overall stats you can see here, we ended up winning 72% of our matches, lost 36 games of 296. And uh, we did okay, didn't we? Um, I mean, uh, other than the days on holiday, which I've just spent on holiday as we've gone forward into the future, there were no days on holiday prior. And uh, yeah, we, we did done okay. 1,832 days in the job. And uh, of course, a fair amount won at Newcastle. But the question I'm sure that's on the tip of your tongue is, what became a Newcastle after I left? Let's take a look, shall we? So Mauricio Pochettino is their manager. He did immediately come in after my departure. He was given the job on the 2nd of August. And uh, well, looking at things here, that they won a fair bit. Let's take a look at Newcastle season. They finished top of the Premier League. They finished on 90 points. Was that more or less than us the previous year? We got 95 the previous year with 130 scored. They only scored 76 under Pochettino. So I don't want to say almost halved, but a, certainly a significant reduction in the number of goals that Newcastle was scoring. Tactically, they lined up in a 4-3-3. And I have to assume that this is the team that started the final game of the season, which I'm going to assume was the Champions League final. And indeed, it was the Champions League final where they beat Manchester United, Jude Bellingham and Pedri getting the goals in this one. Uh, yeah, a late goal for Pedri. I guess United went on the attack. It wasn't a classic. There wasn't a lot of chances, uh, but Newcastle managed to edge things out with their 4-3-3. A good little team performance. Interesting to see them playing, obviously, a slightly different shape to what we played. Fafana slotting in at right back and then at centre back. They went with Johansson for the final, which is cool to see. Of course, Johansson was one of the first kind of really good regens that we brought through at the club for a really kind of minute sum of money, really, 1.5 million. Played a decent number of games under me. In the 11 games he played in our final year, he got a 7.52 rating. This year, he played 36 games in the Premier League, so he has really come into the team and been a big part of what they've achieved. And, uh, well, in terms of what they achieved, they won the Champions League. They also beat Manchester United in the FA Cup final. So, a bit of an upset to end the year. Haaland up top in this game with Mbappe out on the left. Johansson is again playing in the back. And uh, Ramsdale putting in a really good performance with an 8.1 rating. Um, on the road to the Champions League final, they knocked out Real Madrid, Bayern Munich. Uh, yeah, they beat some pretty big teams. Uh, and Shakhtar Donetsk also up there. Looks like they had a really, really strong end to the season with a load of wins. I wonder if part of that was Pochettino kind of getting to grips with the squad. You can see here their past positions through the year. They dropped off the pace a little bit. We're in third for an extended period, but that run of form at the end saw Newcastle climb to the summit and end up winning the league. Shall we have a look? Did they do any transfers? After I left the club, this should be interesting. I'd be amazed if they did any. Um, they signed Momar and Dom, who, if I'm not mistaken, was a guy I'd already agreed to sign. So that wasn't even one of their signings. He joined for 11.5 million. That took the spending to 447 million for this season. Although that doesn't include Pedri and Camavinga, who also came in for 245 million pounds. So it's going to be interesting now to see in the next few years what kind of money is spent. Uh, I suppose, by Pochettino or whoever else is in charge at Newcastle. Elsewhere, some players did move on after we left. A lot of players loaned out. Um, looks like maybe an affiliation with Stoke was started just by the sheer quantity of players going that way. Mo Salah left on a free to go to Zebra. And uh, Leonidas, who I have high hopes for as a goalkeeper, um, he ended up going on loan to Swansea. So yeah, all in all, Newcastle, rather successful in year one. Don't think that's entirely surprising. Jude Bellingham kept as captain. 
with Declan Rice as vice. And, uh, well, yeah, they, they played rather well. In terms of the goal scorers, Mbappe got 25, Haaland got 25. I mean, considering Erlen Haaland in previous years was getting kind of 40-plus goals a season, to get 14 in 27 almost feels like an underperformance from a man with a 7.54 average rating across all those league games. Maybe the standards are set a little bit high. Elsewhere, Aguilar came off the bench a lot, so good to see him continuing to get regular football. He looks like he's improved a little bit, of course, because I've got a tribute masking on. We can't really see definitively how good he is, but he looks rather solid. And in terms of players playing all the matches, Ramsdale, Bellingham, and then Johansson actually played the third most amount of games in the year at centre-back. Is there any players down on the lower side of things that's kind of surprising? I guess Adiemi with only 12 appearances as starts and 12 off the bench might be a tad low. Similar with Havertz as well. Uh, Neymar out on loan at Genoa. Of course they loaned him to Genoa. Why wouldn't they loan him to Genoa? You know what? I have no further questions. Also, Calvert-Lewin. So on. I don't know, get the funeral organised. He's played four games, didn't score, just wasn't given any game time. A player who was critical to our success, win us a Champions League, at least in Pochettino's eyes, somewhat surplus to requirements, which I suppose was going to happen to someone with all this firepower in the final third. But anyway, interesting stuff, I think. If you spot anything, of course, with this video that I don't see, Please do let me know it down in the comments. I will always miss stuff in these kind of videos. I can't have my eyes everywhere. When tens of thousands of you look, you will see stuff that I miss. Um, but yeah, all in all, they won everything. I would like to think that I would have done the same. I mean, I can never actually prove it. Now I'm interested to know what the long-term kind of success is going to look like here at Newcastle. Can they maintain their squad's quality? Um, it's not an old squad, so I would like to think they're going to have a period of dominance. I think we'll go forward to 2031, five years on from my departure, four years in the future. Is it going to be a reign of dominance of world football by Newcastle, or is my, shall we say, questionable financial decision-making going to impact them? Let's go find out. Okay, five years in the future, not much has changed, we're not living underwater yet, and uh, Pochettino is still manager at the club. He's been here now for four years and 310 days, he's won five leagues, 13 cup wins. Does that mean they've won the Premier League every year? It does mean they've won the Premier League every year. Interesting to note though, they've not got a player in the top goal scoring charts, although Mbappe does appear in the top ratings. And also, Jude Bellingham and Declan Rice getting a lot of assists this year, which is cool to see. Ramsdale leading the way with clean sheets. I'm now interested. How recognisable does this Newcastle United team look? Okay, or immediately, it's way smaller than it was last time we were here. Also, Leonidas is now the backup goalkeeper, which is cool to see. No cap to Brazil just yet, though. In terms of their top goal scorer, Mbappe got 31, Haaland got 29. Both of them now in their early 30s, but both with contracts for another two years. Aguilar is also at the club. He's valued very highly. He looks absolutely sensational. 71 caps, 54 goals, only 24 years old. I can only hope they're going to renew his contract because he seems like the obvious long-term replacement for Mbappe and Haaland. Elsewhere, Pedri had a really, really good season. Of course, we signed him as a, a parting gift. And over the last five years, he's probably lived up to the £120 million price tag. Um, if you're wondering how convincingly they won the Premier League over the last few years, they won it with 89 points, 85 points the year prior, only one point ahead of Liverpool. The season before that, they went unbeaten, 106 goals. Oh, sorry, not 106 goals, 106 points, 91 goals, only 21 against. And that's uh, an unbeaten season. And then the season before that, uh, they beat Manchester United to the title by six points. So... Yeah, a, a pretty dominant display, it has to be said. In terms of their transfer dealings over the last few years, of course, when we left things, um, things were looking like this. They'd obviously spent the money on Haaland. The following year, £152 million spent. Talas Magno was the big addition there, signed for £110 million. Not sure he's quite lived up to the price tag looking at that. That looks like a questionable signing at best, but he was their big addition. And on the outs, they sold Kai Havertz to PSG, for £119 million, and now he's gone on to have a really phenomenal career, uh, obviously playing for PSG in League 1. The year after that, they spent £0, although Marquinhos joined on a free. He's now just 37 and chilling at the club, although with a model citizen personality, maybe he's a good tutor. And in terms of on the outs, they let Ben Godfrey go for £47 million, Calvert-Lewin left on a free, and uh, Reynoso 
only sold for £4.5 million, and now he's playing for Wolfsburg. So, uh, yeah, he's not had the best of careers. I mean, the hair was very deceiving, wasn't it? The hair convinced me he was going to be good. He wasn't very good, it turns out. Anyway, 2029-30, uh, they signed Goodell for £110 million. He is a Brazilian playmaker slash wide player. He looks really, really solid. Um, how's he done for them? Has he justified that price? He played eight games this season and got three goals. I'm not sure he justified the price looking at that. Looks like he was signed right at the end of the season before. So this is actually kind of a season signing that was made for this season for £110 million. And he was their only addition. So I suspect that all the transfer dealings I've done have had, shall we say, a compromising effect on the club. On outs, uh, they sold uh, 85 or 86 million pounds worth of players. Uh, Bruno... E.T. left the club. He has ended up going to Wolverhampton Wanderers. Peter Paul has gone out on loan to Swansea. Tamori left for £34 million, which probably isn't a bad sum of money to receive for a player in his early 30s. And, uh, well, a few other players. Andy Harwood, the left-back, who I thought was really going to be special. No England caps, age 24, but he's done okay. Wasn't really ever given a chance at Newcastle, especially after my departure, which makes me feel a little bit sad. And then most recently, um, in terms of transfer dealings, lots of players let go on freeze. Edu Kunha, you might remember, was a very late addition, one of the signings we made at the end of the final episode. He looks like a crazy talent. I mean, he looks really, really good. I'm a little bit concerned they've let go of a really good player there. They gave him away on a free transfer as well. I guess they just weren't playing him enough. Alan Ezzi has also left the club, the Saudi youngster. He's 25 years old and he looks really, really good, but... Yeah, not, not being given much of an opportunity. And then elsewhere on the outs, uh, Derry Macarenas, or the Macarena guy, as I like to refer to him as, he's left for 4.9 million. A player who I was convinced they would never lose money on, and yet somehow they've managed to do it. I suppose the question is, what other competitions have they been able to do well in over the last few years? Of course, we left things. They beat Manchester United in the Champions League final. The following year, they actually lost to Bayern Munich in the Champions League final. They had a shot to retain it, and, uh, well, they got completely FM'd. They stuck with their 4 3 3. They had an XG of 1.66. Bayern had a 0.38 XG, managed to score two, and well, they lost. Johansson, again playing in this game. Is he still at the club? He is still at the club. He looks ridiculous, doesn't he? He's 25 years old, and he looks like one of the world's best centre backs just looking at things there. So disappointment that year. The next year, though, they managed to win the Champions League. So three finals in three years. On this occasion, they won on penalties. In the end, Marcus Rashford missed a penalty and all of the players managed to score theirs. A game that went to extra time. Um, you'd have to sound the balance of play. Newcastle probably deserved it all in all. Fafana with a 9.3 rating at right back is uh, a little bit bizarre. Worth noting they played a midfield triangle of Camavinga, Jude Bellingham, and Declan Rice. I mean, that is... I mean, just Bellingham, to be honest, and Camavinga as a midfield pairing. That's kind of as good a pairing of midfielders as you're ever going to see, isn't it? Like, they are they are absolutely ridiculous in-game. And, uh, well, unsurprisingly, they managed to win a Champions League. The following year, they got knocked out in the semi-final against Manchester United, who finally exerted some revenge. Um, and then in 2031, they won the FA Cup final, which, let's have a quick look. How many times have they won the FA Cup? Uh, only two times since our departure. Of course, we won it three years in a row. They've only won it two out of the last five years since then. That's disappointing. And then in the Carabao Cup, um, they have managed to win that one three years in a row for what it's worth. But it's not, it's not as special as the FA Cup. Let's not pretend otherwise. All in all, though, somewhat unsurprisingly... They're doing bloody well. Uh, in terms of the overall best 11, just so you can see it here and kind of where the players are at. We've got Ramsdale in goal, of course. Johansson, Gavardiol, Fafana at the back. Alfonso Davies and Livramento, who is still at the club. Is Davies still at the club? He is. Are all these players still at the club? I feel like they've not really changed the squad that much, which is kind of mad, right? The entirety of that back six are still at the club. Camavinga's still at the club. I mean, to be fair, we did kind of set the team up in such a way where there was just an abundance of talent. The only player not in the starting 11 is Calvert-Lewin. Well, not still at the club in the starting 11 is Calvert-Lewin. It's kind of crazy. Like, you look at the squad, obviously, it's a lot smaller than it was previously. But 
whilst we are kind of on the, the brink of a generational shift, there's still a lot of players that I brought to the club who are still kind of, you know, playing on the regular. You can see Bellingham and Rice leading the way with the assists. Mbappe having good seasons. It's weird, right? I feel like if Mbappe or, or Haaland were like the star man on their own, they'd probably get way more in terms of individual statistics. But because of the fact they're obviously playing in our squad, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to achieve stuff to quite the same degree. I am interested just to have a look at stuff like the uh, the World Player of the Year and stuff. So with goal 50 and the best players, Pedri, Haaland and Bellingham have all win it. Of course, prior to that, Haaland had a, a rather long spell of dominance. In terms of the goalkeeper of the year, Ramsdale managed to win it once. I mean, he's won it twice, actually. He's done okay. I mean, he's no Donnarumma, but Donnarumma's just still at PSG. I don't mean they're ever going to sell him. In terms of World Player of the Year, Mbappe and Haaland battling it out. But of course, they play alongside one another. So that's absolutely fine. In terms of the Ballon d'Or, Mbappe's won it the last three years in a row. Interesting to note that Jude Bellingham has come up in third place on a few occasions. Also, Chiesa seems to have done rather well. World Player of the Year, similar story. It's not a different award. Where is Adiemi still at the club? Adiemi's at Arsenal. He left for 81 million. I think I missed that one. So there you go. He's done rather well over his time at Arsenal. I don't know if they got a good deal. Newcastle to sell him at £81 million, but it's not impacted their ability to win the league, so I suppose it's fine. Then in terms of World Team of the Year, for the year just gone, Mbappe, uh, Pedri, Bellingham um, in the starting eleven, Gvardiol, Kamavinga and Haaland also on the bench. I'll flick through all the years and you can have a look here. In 2029, Newcastle dominant, loads of players on the bench, loads of players in the starting eleven. Um, similar story in 2028. In 2027, again, just a lot of Newcastle. The Newcastle team, I mean, it is basically a world's best 11, isn't it? And if we look at all seasons in the best 11, whilst you've got the likes of Mbappe and Pedri here, they're, of course, in their previous club's kits, but we can, I don't know, squint slightly and imagine the Newcastle shirts that they'd be donning on the bench. Haaland, Ramsdale, Gvardiol, Fafana and Calvert-Lewin, all in the all-seasons world team of the year. I love the fact that Calvert-Lewin has somehow managed to get into the all-seasons team of the year. I don't get that one. Some answers on a postcard. Please, someone explain what I've witnessed there. All in all, though, I think it's pretty safe to say that we left Newcastle in a good little spot. Of course, we are going to do a couple more follow-up videos, I think. I think next time we'll go forward 10 years. We may also jump forward 25 years in the same video, just to look at the slightly kind of wider ramifications of what we achieved at the club. I'm unsure if, if we'll go further than that, but maybe let me know down in the comments. If there's anything I didn't show in this video that you're desperate to see, please let me know. Try to cover kind of all the essentials and tick them off in terms of things that are worth looking at specifically from a Newcastle point of view. But there's always the chance that I've forgotten something. So if there is, let me know down in the comments. If there's anything that particularly surprised you or stuff that I just didn't quite spot, I always appreciate those kind of things being pointed out to me. And I think that's going to wrap up everything from me for now. Next time we'll be back, we'll be five years in the future. A lot of these first team players are going to be in their early 30s. Are they still going to be at the club? Are they going to have been moved on? We'll find out next time. I'll see you guys then. Thank you for watching as always. And it is me, Jack. And I'll talk to you guys in a bit. I'm out.